Hey church, I have a few announcements today. In the letter of James, he writes, Is any among you sick? He should send for the church leaders and they should pray for him. Join us for a healing service on Sunday, September 26 at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary as we pray for those who are sick, both those who are present at the service and those who cannot attend. Second, bring your animals, dogs, cats, turtles, gerbils, whatever pet you love for a blessing of the animal service on Sunday, October 3rd at 3 p.m. in the Crossroad Circle. We will hold a short service of prayer and scripture. We'll remember pets no longer with us and pastors will bless each pet individually. If your pet is not particularly social, pastors can offer a blessing at your car or bless a photo. And finally, it is our tradition at Apex UMC for all third grade students to receive their own Bible signed by our pastors. Families are invited to attend either the 11 o'clock traditional or the 11 o'clock outdoor service on Sunday, October 17th for a presentation of the Bibles and prayer. There will also be an alternate time for picking up Bibles for those who cannot come in person. To participate, sign up on Church Center by September 26th. Apex United Methodist Church. Let's all stand and give God his glory this morning.
Apex, welcome to worship. My name is Laura Catherine, and it is my joy to welcome you to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. As we come into this place filled with hearts eager to be in worship and praise, I just have a few reminders and invitations to go over with you. If you are new to worship with us, whether you're worshiping online or here in person, we invite you to fill out a Connect card. These Connect cards are available online, or you can just flip your bulletin over and scan the QR card and code and fill that out and get back in touch with us and let us know your information so we can share with you about the mission and ministries going on here. Also, we have all sorts of ways that you can stay informed about what's going on in the life of the church. We have our bulletin, we have newsletter, we have social media, we have a YouTube channel. However you choose to follow us, please so that you can learn all that is going on at this church. Also, as you came into this place, we had kiosks, and just invite you and encourage you to check in. And if you don't want to use the kiosks, you can do so on the Church Center app. That helps register your attendance with us this morning. And now, we invite you to be in worship and praise of our Lord. This is amazing grace.
commissioning over those who are going to be participating in YES. And if you're wondering what YES is, that is our Youth Engaged in Service Weekend that is coming up next weekend. So if you are middle school youth who are planning to attend, um, Tanner is here. If he would come forward, if you are one who is volunteering, I'm a volunteer, if you're volunteering to help uh, at either a work site or with the food or the preparation, if you would come forward at this time so that we might have a blessing over you. And I don't see a huge number of people coming forward if there's others who have been part of this in the past, just for camaraderie, if you would come. So we could see that this is um, a ministry that has before and will continue to be one of the ways that we give service. Awesome, awesome, wonderful. Thank you, guys. Yay, <laughs> thank you. Don't leave me up here. Awesome, awesome. Come on, come on. Well, we are grateful for those who are taking the time. It is an entire weekend, Friday, all day Saturday, and um, celebrating with worship on Sunday. It is a great deal of work. It is kind of a middle school version of AOSP. We're going out and working in sites and getting to know both the people and the homeowners and the jobs that need to happen. And it's a time of fellowship, and we are just grateful for all those here and for all those who are supporting this work. And so let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for these servants, these who have felt your call, both in the past and in this upcoming weekend, to be out into the world, to be claiming our faith and our beliefs and the desire to make a difference. God, we pray for safety. We pray for wisdom. We pray for when the heat and the mask and the bugs and all of it is so hard that your grace and your love and your wisdom might surround these here and those joining next weekend, that they might lean on your strength, that they might know your clarity of thought, that they might have your great skill, that in all things and all places we might see you at work. We pray this in your heavenly name. Amen. Thank you guys very much. We, as a people, are a people who pray, and we have an entire intercessory prayer team that would love to pray alongside you, and so we invite you to submit your prayer requests online, and those are looked at weekly and prayed over. But we are mindful that we come into this place, and we are part of a great globe, a globe where God is at work throughout the nations of this world, and also a globe that many places is hurting. Pray especially for Ethiopia and for the unrest there. We pray continued prayers for Afghanistan. We pray for our military throughout the world that they might know your love and your strength. We pray
pray for our nation here, for the many places that are facing and continue to face crisis with COVID-19. For our own communities, for our schools, for our government, for our families, and for our homes. And now at this time, I will pause and just into this space, you may name aloud names or situations, kind of popcorn style, that you would like to collectively lift to God. And so I invite you now, let us pray. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you that we carry these names and these situations not just in our heart, but that we can share them with our faith community. And more importantly, that you, God, know them. That you know the complexity and the pretty. You know the celebrations and you know the heartbreaks. And you are there working. God, let us trust in your presence. Let us recognize your work. Let us celebrate your grace that in all things and all places we might be a people of praise and we might say the words Christ Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We offer our prayers to God, and we also offer an offering to God. And so at this time, we turn to share in our tithes and our offerings. And if you are watching this online, just a reminder that you can text to give, you can go online and that way. We also, if you're in person, we'll have baskets going through the congregation. But however you choose to give, we ask that you give with glad and generous hearts. All the earth will show your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will say continuing today in our series on James. Today's reading comes from James chapter 3, verse 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, 
able to keep the whole body in check with the bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great is a forest set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and it itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, every reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing my brothers and sisters. This ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and black, brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. From the cowardice that dares not face new truth, from the laziness that is contented with half truth, from the arrogance that thinks it knows all truth, good Lord, deliver us. Amen. The epistle of James is not known for a love of words. It is much more known for a love of action. For those of you who were here last week, pastors, Pastor Laura's sermon spoke of doing something, something meaningful, something impactful, something transformative, something relevant. Francis Assisi is known for the adage, preach the gospel and, if necessary, use words. That's a very James-like kind of statement. Don't just talk about it. Don't just give words to it. I mean, do something about it. Put your faith into action. And yet, today's scripture comes to us from James chapter 2. This is arguably the only section in James that is not about actions, but is about words. The power of words. The way the tongue is wild in its very nature, capable of praise in one moment and curses the next. The way our words, our speech, needs to be watched, monitored, regulated. Or as James says in the scripture passage, tamed. Now, this is rather uncomfortable for us to focus on as Methodists. Methodists are chronic doers. You saw that from our commissioning of the Yes Volunteers just moments ago. We as Methodists, our natural default posture is one that wants to do something, to fix something, to serve somewhere. At the very least, if we can't figure out something to do, then we form a committee to talk about what we can do about it. We are focused on our hands and our feet much more than we are focused on our tongues. And yet this passage from James reminds us of the ways that our words have tremendous power. James uses this wonderful imagery to capture and describe this. He talks about the way that the tongue acts as if it was like a bit in the mouth of a horse or a rudder on a ship. The way that this one small member can direct and take charge and cast a vision that moves the whole greater whole. I listened 
listen to a daily podcast. The speaker on it is Garrison Keillor. It's called The Writer's Almanac. And if you're new to listening to me preach, you will find out that I use a lot of illustrations in my sermons from that Writer's Almanac. And one I learned about recently was a Russian poet by the name of Anna Akhmatova. She was born in 1889, and she was quite the fashionista. When she was just 22 years old, she had this scandalous affair with an Italian artist, and she decided to write it up in poetry. And she became an overnight celebrity in Russia. Everybody was fascinated with her poetry and her writing and her love for this artist. According to this podcast, she was described this way. Women all over Russia wanted to be like her, and men all over Russia fell in love with her. But within a few years, Russia became a much darker, much more complicated place. And Akhmatova realized that there was more to write about than lurid love affairs. When World War I broke out, she started a poem with the line, we grew a hundred years older in a single hour. In 1917, in the Bolshevik Revolution, Most of her friends, most writers, most intellectuals, all of them left the country. It wasn't safe for people like them. And yet, Akhmatova decided that she would stay, along with her common-law husband and her son. And she lived through the Stalinist era, an era which was called the Terror, and the one that followed, which was called the Thaw. Now, she was so well-known and so beloved in Russia that Stalin feared attacking her. And so he chose instead to forbid her from writing or publishing a single word, and he decided instead to go after her family, imprisoning both her husband and her son. For 17 months, Akhmatova went every day to the prison in Leningrad, hoping beyond hope that she would catch a glimpse of her loved ones. Others, like her, gathered outside the prison. And one day, someone recognized her, knew she was the great poet, and so went over and whispered in her ear, can you describe this? And she thought to herself, I can. It took her 30 years to write her poem, the poem called Requiem, which is considered the greatest piece of literature about Stalinist Russia. But she was too fearful to write her poem as one manuscript, and so she would write line by line on little fragments of paper, give those fragments of paper to her friends, and ask them to memorize it and then burn the papers. She was that fearful of what would happen if anyone were to find out about her words and her poem. It was a long 10-cycle poem. And the entire poem did not actually come out until 1963 in Germany. And it wasn't until the 80s, the 1980s, way after she had died, before the poem was published in Russia. Now, Akhmatova was a mere romance poet. And yet, her words yielded such power that they couldn't even be contained in the same place for fear of punishment and repercussions, and most of all, fear that her story would go untold. And you might say, we know this. The pen is mightier than the sword. The word is so important. But do we really? 
I am a preacher. That means I am in the same camp as poets and songwriters, as those who believe with all their hearts that words don't simply communicate. They transform the world. But I have to admit, I'm probably in the minority. The world has been inundated with such careless, empty, abusive, hypocritical, and manipulative words that we have lost their sense of power. It has been robbed. I recall my fifth grade English teacher, Miss Edgerton. Miss Edgerton told us that if someone were asks you, how are you doing? Do not say, I'm fine. That fine is a meaningless word. It tells you nothing. It is just a gut response, automatic. I'm fine. No, instead, she challenged us to think through what words we would use to articulate exactly how it was we were feeling or we were doing or what was going on in our lives. But little did Miss Edgerton know, she created a bit of a monster in me. <laughs> because from that day as a young girl, I remember that passerbys and store clerks and people I'd meet on the bus would just say, how are you doing? And I knew what Miss Edgerton had told me, so I was not going to say I'm fine. And so being one who likes words and talks a lot, I would fill them with a full description of how I was doing. And they didn't want to hear it. <laughs> the thing of it is, we live by a culture, we live in a society that is pretty comfortable with pleasantries. We are good with empty words. We are totally fine with I am fine. And it makes me think of the way that we have allowed the power of words imagery, poetry, pro prophets, all of it to be taken away. We have robbed it of its beauty and its possibility and its opportunity and it's a way to open up a whole new world. We have settled for the superficial and the mundane as long as it lets us just skate on by one more day. And even worse, and I find myself guilty of this often, is we have come to this idea that there are times and there are places and there are situations where there are no words. I remember just a few weeks ago I was standing up here and I was sharing the prayer of the people and I was noting the way that Hurricane Ida was about to come down on New Orleans and noting the way that that Sunday, that day, was 16 years to the day where Hurricane Katrina had made landfall. And as I said these words in this space, I thought, there are no words to describe what the people must be feeling in this moment. Or I think about last weekend, last weekend where we marked 20 years since 9-11, and I heard many, many tributes, both in church and secular and on television, and in so many ways and in so many places, I heard it repeated, there are no words to describe what happened that day. There are no words to explain the devastation and the heartbreak and the loss and the implications on history and security and military and all of it. There are no words. There are no words to describe what happened in the passengers on United 93 and the heroism and the sacrifice. There are no words. No words. So just a few days ago, I was sitting with a friend, and she was describing the way that her child, who I knew has cancer, was now going to have to travel, leave to a special city and a special place to not just do his chemo, but now his radiation and this particular cancer could come back. And I, I sit there listening to this, and I'm a pastor. 
I'm a believer in the words. I'm a preacher of the words. And yet I found myself with no words. Just simply sitting there listening. So I too have bought into this philosophy that there are no words. And yet what are we doing here today? If we are not believers in the word, the word made flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. When we go, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. When we read from the scripture, it is the collective word of God, a word that has been passed down and is timeless and is true. And we want to pass on to generations to come. It is the word, our word, God's word to us. We come in here and we sing words. Words of praise, words of promise, words that we believe so much we want to articulate and sing them out loud because we believe that there are, in fact, words. Yesterday, I did a funeral here. And as the family came in, I went to the funeral liturgy. I read the words that I have said countless times, the words of Jesus, because I lived, you will live also. Those are words. We think that we have nothing to say to a grieving world, nothing to say to a grieving family, nothing to say to ourselves when we are hurt and we are grieving and we are distraught. And yet, we have liturgy, we have hymns, we have songs, we have lessons inside us. We have words, because you live, I shall live also. That is saying to us that this death is not the end, that this funeral that we hold, held is not the end, that this human earthly relationship is not ending, it is changing. It lives on in God, it lives on in grace, it lives on in hope, it lives on in the resurrection. We have words. Many are here today because Sunday school started, and so your children are in Sunday school, or your children are in children's church, or your children are being held in the nursery, and they are being taught with words, with lessons, taught the scripture that is the word, and those words matter. And if you can't believe it here, we believe it in our lives. We believe it in our relationships. We believe it when we say or when we hear the words, I love you, or I'm sorry. We know in those moments that words have power. We might have fooled ourselves into forgetting it. We might have allowed words and their power to be debased by our society and our easy use of words, especially meaningless ones. We might have fooled ourselves into thinking that we have no words, but at the end of the day, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be speaking to our loved ones. We wouldn't be tucking our children in at night. We wouldn't be on our knees praying to God, using words, if we didn't understand on some level those words' power. And I had to think the scripture for today is meant to come to us today, this day, that we might evaluate anew our words. We might take into account their power. Their ability to motivate, their ability to create, their ability to comfort, their ability to console, their abil ability to convict, their ability to teach, their ability to change the world. Gary Chapman's an author, he wrote that five love languages. It was all the rage when I first started in ministry. Every church, every Sunday school was using it. A couple Sunday school, a couple years ago, another Sunday school used it again. I mean, this this thing, and I have to admit, I still haven't read it. But anyway, but it's a big, it's a, it's, it's a book that's often used. Now, he writes another book, Love as a Way of Life. And in it, he uses this really interesting metaphor. He talks about words as two ways. That words can be used as bullets that kill a relationship, 
but words can be used as seeds that plant the truth, that take root and grow, that influence the person in whose heart it was planted. Now I'll let you read Chapman's book if you want to go through that dichotomy of the bullets and the seeds. But I share it here more because both of those images show the power of words. Bullets and seeds both garner tremendous power. And if you take anything away from this scripture today, please take that away. That well-chosen, well-crafted, faithful words, words that are true and kind and grounded in the word, our God, is what this world needs. This is a call to action to reconsider our words and to resurrect their collective and individual power. Glory to God. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this scripture. We thank you for the reminder that our tongues yield such power. And God, we know that power when words have been used as bullets to kill our dreams and kill our hopes and kill our vision who we are and who this world should be. And we pray instead that our words be more like seeds. That our words grow new things and new possibilities and new hopes and new places of praise and witness to you. That we, in turn, might be renewed to know your word and give it all the praise that is possible. We pray this in your heavenly name. Amen. the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, holy is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the
and have that be our benediction and blessing at this time. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Go forth. Give God the praise, the glory, and share. Crashing all over my beliefs And in all sincerity, Lord, I want to be yours mm. So pull me out of this mess I'm in Cause I know I'm wandering Leave my soul back home again I've always been yours And this world may push me, pull 